So, as I announced last time, in case you didn't know, this is the recitation move from far away there to close up here. So that's where we be. Um, so, are there, are there, are people confused about how to do things like, I don't know, find the distance between a point and a plane, or find a plane containing three points, or those kinds of things? have a point of confusion they would like you to clear up. How many of you started the homework? How many of you have trouble with the homework? Okay. Uh, well, it's good. So do you, is there something I can clear up? Okay, first it was like IKG or Okay, that's fine. I mentioned it briefly, but briefly only. So if we have, say, in the yes. plane, we call this guy I. We call this guy J. If we're in three space, we'll call this guy I, this guy J, and this guy K. So I is a one in the first place, and then as many zeros as you need to be the right dimension. J is a zero in the first place, a one in the second place, and as many zeros as you need to be the right dimension. I is 1, 0, 0. This is not the same I as the square root of negative 1. K is 0, 0, 1. And if we're in a higher dimension, we're going to run out of letters pretty quickly. So this is also called E1. And this is also called E2. And this one's called E3. And if I'm in a five-dimensional space, so in general, E, K, well, um, okay, so this I is a different I from that I. How about E, N? It's going to be all zeros, a 1, and all zeros, where this is in the end place. So the E, I's are the standard basis vectors for R, M, where we put, this is the i chord, the end chord. Yep. Other questions or confusions or? Yes. Just now that you mentioned it, can you give me an example of finding this is going to Sure. Okay. So, here's some plane. Let's say it is, I don't know, 3x plus 2y minus z equals 2. Uh, will that work? Let's see. I'm sure that one will work. And I have some point. Um, I don't know which side of the plane it's on. I don't care. Um, 1, 2, 3. That better not be on the plane. Let's see. 3 plus 4 is 7. Mine is good. 7 minus 3 is equal to 2. Okay, good. Okay, so I want to find the distance. So, Distance here, let me put my thing at that. So I want to find the distance between this point three x plus two y minus z. That's the problem I want to do. Okay, so really you know all the stuff you need to know to do this. You just need to realize that you know. So usually when we're finding the distance between two things in this class, we're going to find a pair of vectors and project one onto the other. So now we just have to think about what are the right vectors that we want, and then we'll compute the projection of one vector onto the other. So there's sort of a vector naturally associated with this plane. What is it? Okay. I was asking her, but it's okay. <laughs> right, so, so the normal vector associated with this plane, and let me put it here, just 
to draw something. There's the normal vector. Let's call it n. And what vector is it? Do you, do you see what vector it is now? If you don't, okay. You don't think so? Okay. So, I mean, some people do. And so the reason I'm asking her is because she asked the question. So does somebody want to tell me what it is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you. Right. So 3, 2, negative 1. Why is it 3, 2, negative 1? It's 3, 2, negative 1 because this plane is the set of all the points that look like um, some vector n dotted with, I don't know, p minus, well, I don't know call it. I don't know, p minus v equals 0. Where p is some point, let's call this guy p. p is some point in the plane, and it's the collection of all the vectors v here in the plane, so that if I take the dot product of v minus p, well, really this is v minus. If I take v minus p and dot it with n, they have to be at a right angle. Because the plane is, I tell you which way it is and where to start it, and I want all the stuff that's perpendicular to it. So if you can just read off from this, this 3, 2, negative 1, that's what I'm dotting with my arbitrary vector v, p minus v, to get it. Okay, and what's a point in the plane? Which I'm going to call p. Is anything that satisfies this equation. So since there's a 2 here and a 2 here, why not make this be a 1 and make those be zeros and then it's easy. So I can take 0, 1, 0. That satisfies the equation. I can also take anything else that satisfies the equation, but this one will work. Because it's easy. Alright? So I can also take 0, 0, negative 2, or lots of choices. So now we have this vector p, this point p, this vector n here, and this guy 1, 2, 3. Well, 1, 2, 3, if I put the origin here, is this vector. And that's not really of much use to me. I want a different vector. What vector do I want? I'm just looking for people whose names I have. Yeah. Okay, what's your name? Sam. Sam. You can get the, the vector that's the difference from P to 1, 2, 3. Right. So if I, if I, I think can start using colors. If I take this vector from P to 1, 2, 3, then what I want is this perpendicular vi distance here which is the same as this distance, if I make a rectangle there. And so now this is starting to look like a problem that you've done before. I have the red vector, let's make n a little shorter just to emphasize it. And I have the black vector n. And what I want is this green link, which is the projection of the red vector in the direction of the black vector. See that? Okay. So that's what I want to, that, so that'll be my distance. So my distance is the projection of my red vector, uh, well, I don't even know, P is 0, 1, 0. So 1, 2, 3 minus 0, 1, 0 in the direction of 3, Two, negative one. Yeah. Wouldn't it be simple since you already know? Yeah. Okay. Um, since you already know the normal vector. Yeah. Can't you just make a line using the normal vector from the point you're given, and then solve for where that line crosses the well, plane? Would that be simpler? I think that would be harder. Okay. Maybe it would be simpler. That's okay. I can certainly find a line that yeah. goes through one, two, three, in the direction of n and then find out where that line crosses the plane, which is a little tricky but still doable, and then 
take the distance between those two. But this is actually a very easy calculation once you sort of conceptualize what's going on, right? I just subtract this minus that, that was easy. And now I'm going to take the dot product and dot it with, I didn't give him a name, I call it R, and dot it with R for red, divided by the length of n. That's the length I want. So that's really easy because n dotted with this guy, that's R, is uh, 3, um, 2, well, this is 1, this subtraction is 1, so that's 2, and then negative 1 plus 3 is 2, and on the bottom, I have the length of n, the length of n is the square root of 9 plus 4 plus 1 is the square root of 14. So the distance is 2 over the square root of 14. Yeah? Okay. So I look at this, so we have to remember how we define a plane. One way to define a plane is we can do it parametrically where we find two vectors in the plane and we take any combination of them. <coughs> the other way, which is a little more familiar, is to say it's everything that's perpendicular to some vector. And here, it's just these coordinates in front of x, y, and z. Because I, this is really, so let me do that over here. So a plane, we can define as either some vector p, which is a point in the plane, plus t times v1, well, let's call it v plus S times W, where P is in the plane, V and W are, ve are, are non-linearly dependent. They're non-parallel vectors in the plane. So this is not the useful formulation, although we can turn it into one, which is just saying, start here at the origin, go to P, and then look at V, and look at W, and consider all the combinations of them. But the other way that is more useful to us in this context, is we think about the normal vector here, N, and we say, it's all the guys who sit in the plane, let's call this guy, I don't know, S. It's, no, I already used S. Uh, U. It's all the u, so that n dotted with u um, minus p is 0. It's all the u's here, so that if I look at the distance, I mean, I look at the vector that lives in the plane between p and u, it's at a right angle to n. And it's all those same guys. And in this case, these guys are of the form, these guys are always of the form, let me write it this way, x minus x naught, y minus y naught, z minus z naught. That's these guys. And n is something, a, b, e, c. So the dot product of those is 0. So that means it's, in the, it's something that looks like a, x minus x naught, plus b, y minus y naught, plus c, z minus z naught, is zero. And now if I gather all of the non-variables together, I get ax plus by plus, is this visible? Not really. Then that will fall in green, so I shouldn't Sorry, best I can do. It's all good here. AX plus BY plus CZ equals some number of K. Where this K is negative, is AX naught plus BY naught plus CZ naught. Okay? So just thinking about how planes work, that tells me my normal is 
A, B, C. So here I have the equation. 3x plus 2y minus z tells me that the normal vector is 3, 2, negative 1. Yeah? Okay. So that was a long trip to get somewhere, but I think it's important that you guys are clear on that. Yeah? What's vector B? In this one? Yeah. This B? Uh, it's just from the origin to somebody in the plane. Which, did I call him V here? Here I call them U. But where is that in the plane? Anywhere. So when you give an when you try and describe some object, it's all the collections of things that have a certain property. This is what we do a lot. It's all the vectors who, when I take a dot product with n, they're perspicuous. <coughs> So it doesn't matter what you would have subtracted in the... In the so in this problem, I should get the same answer if instead of choosing the point 0, 1, 0, I came over here and chose the point, uh oh, I've lost the equation, uh, 0, 0, negative 2. I should get the same answer. So if you do it with the... Now, of course, this red vector will be over here. So I'll be projecting a different vector onto the normal. But I should get the same answer. Because this plane is described independent of the base point. It doesn't care what point P I choose as long as it lives in the plane. So it has to satisfy this equation. But there was nothing magic about the fact that I used 0, 1, 0 other than it was easy to see. I could have used 3 halves 0, 0, or I could have used 1, 1, uh, 3. Lots of choices there. Yeah? Uh, it's not very relevant to what I'm talking about. It's just uh, it's so. uh, given the two points in yes. the, the three-dimensional um, yeah. yeah. how do you like, express the line? OK. So parametrically? I mean, uh, like vector vectorially? Uh, sure. So yes. here's two points. One, two, three. Four, five, six. No, I mean, I have a function. Yeah? Express What do you mean function? Like the uh, like two dimensions. You want coordinates like x, y, z. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are annoying because you need three equations. True. Yeah, that's my question. And so usually people write something like x minus x naught over a equals y minus y naught over b equals z minus z naught over c. Because technically it should be because two dots can like determine a lot. Yeah, so that this works. Oh, okay. So pick a point x, y naught, and z naught. Those are one point on the line. And a is actually x1 minus x naught, y1 minus y naught, z1 minus z naught. So, but this is really two equations. Right? This is relating x and y, and y and z. Pick, pick two, and then I get two equations. So this is two equations and three unknowns. You can write it this way. And this is really... Is there any benefit to doing that? No. I think it's stupid. That's why I didn't talk about it. But people do this. And, and in some... I mean, when I took, when I took multivariable calculus, back when there were dinosaurs and stuff, <laughs> we used this form a lot. I think this form is basically stupid, but it's fine. Because really you're describing a plane and a plane. But I think the other way is sort of more natural. But it's okay. Yeah? When you have the vector that has A, B, C as its components there, is that the vector to the point? Yeah. No, the ABC there is, is, I think, parallel is the vector. Did I get that right? I think this is right. Okay, so what, is, what is it represent? The vector along the line. Along the normal vector? So, okay. So here we have a point. Let's check this. X1, Y1, Z1. And here I have a point. Well, I called it x0. x0, y0, z0. Right? And I want to consider everything along this line. So sort of a natural geometric way 
for, in my brain to do this is to think about this vector and just say I take x1, y1, z1, and to it I add any, any multiple of x1 minus x0, y1 minus y0, z1 minus z0. That's sort of the parametric is there form. question you just asked? Yeah. Oh, I was talking I'm, about the example before that. Oh, okay. Well then, I'll stop that. So what is, what is the vector with ABC? Here, variables? this ABC, that's the components of N. So that's the vector to the point on the normal vector that the plane intersects, or that's the normal vector? It's the normal vector. Okay. It's not a point on the normal vector. It's the normal vector. Okay. Right? So for example, if I take if I take the plane who has normal vector 1, 1, 1 passing through the origin, that will be the plane x plus y. So the normal vector is 1, 1, 1. That will be the plane x plus y plus z equals 0. But 1, 1, 1 does not satisfy this equation. So it's not a point on the plane, nor is it a point. Right? Okay, yeah. Sorry, um, when you define a plane by everything perpendicular to the normal, uh, when you're writing out mathematically, you're like, the normal stops right where the plane starts, right? It touches the point on the plane? Like, how do you define how far along? A normal is a, is a direction. Okay. It's a direction with a, with a magnitude that we don't care about. But right? then, if you define it's, it's a ratio, it's a, it's a pair of slopes, if you will, written in a convenient form. So it's just saying, here's my plane, and that's the way you go to get away in the fastest way you can. Yeah. Now, that may or may not have a lot to do with where the origin is. I don't, I'm not talking about the origin, I just mean if you find everything perpendicular to that, yeah. then when you have a series of planes. Right, that's why we have a point. So, okay, that's so why I have this other, oh, that's what this number K. That's sliding up and down all of those infinite series to pick a, 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 that infinite collection of planes. So K is literally like the distance along the normal that you travel. Okay, well, sure. I mean, not really, but it's yeah, closely not. related to that distance. As you increase K, it's, it's off by a factor. Yeah, that's just, you just shift the plane up and down. Yeah, the plane shifts the plane up and down. So what you should think of in terms of this number, if K is zero, this plane contains the origin. Yeah. If k increases, this plane moves away from the origin in the direction of the normal vector by some amount related to k. And if k decreases, then it moves towards, well, moves the other way, which decreasing negative means away in the other direction. Right. And you should think of this, this part as describing a stack of pieces of paper, plain things, and k is choosing which one, yeah. okay. which is the same as choosing these points, x0, y0, z0. Yeah. Yeah. In the textbook, if you, after you long like the that equation, and you find that if you want to find the distance between that point, so then, yes. after you long like the bank uh, region, if you find the point, <coughs> I don't know what that means. Normalize the plane and plot in the coordinate of the point. C A X plus B Y plus C B. Yes. Make sure that that's a unit vector. Yes. Okay. Sure. That's one. Because so if you if you do that, if you make sure that the length of your normal vector is one, then when we are calculating this dot product, if the length of n is one, and this is a one on the bottom. And so we're taking a unit vector dotted with some R. So sure, because it's a unit vector. Because when you divide by one, not much changes. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're below the plane and does it lie on the same side as the plane? Right. Well, so what does above or below mean? But so, so that's, that's sort of the same as his question here about the k. If I plug in 0, 
where will it go? So let it So the normal is going to define, if we consider, if you consider the normal vector as describing a line through the origin, put 0, 0, 0 on there. Okay? So consider the line with, in the direction of the normal, put 0, 0, 0 on there. Then, so now I'm going to consider, I don't remember if this is how it's phrased, this is being up. Because there's no sort of natural up, right? Except for maybe think, well, they actually defined it as in the y-axis, right? I, I forget. I don't know. But anyway, so you have to pick some notion of up because I don't know what above means. I do know what on the other side of the origin means. And so the question now is, is P here or is P here? Well, to decide whether P is here or here, well, should have something to do with looking at these vectors. So think about that. I don't want to want you to think about it. Okay, so I'm going to move on because I seem to have worked up about half the class already. No, not quite. Only a third. A little more than a third. Uh, because this is not what I'm talking about today. And in fact, what I wrote in my notes is Remind people about the cross product. <laughs> um, yeah, I did an excellent job. So you know, um, yeah, I know. So I'm going to actually, I think, skip over that. So get Albert to remind you about the cross product. If I want to move on, or we can get too far. What? <laughs> Arthur. 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 Yeah. Oh, sorry. Arthur. Get Arthur. I just met him two weeks ago. <laughs> um, get Arthur to remind you about the cross product. It shocks me. What? Yeah, I could use that name too. That would help you remember, I guess. Anyway. Okay. So, what I want to do is sort of change gears a little bit. Except it's not really changing gears, but it may not be clear that we're not changing gears. Does that make any sense? No. Yeah. Yeah. What I want to do is talk about systems of equations and solving equations, which on the face of it doesn't seem to have a lot to do with this. So if I have, let's use the one, well, let's do lines here. So if I have like x plus y equals 1 and 2x, uh-oh. I don't know why I'm using the one that I have. It doesn't matter. If I have this system of equations, probably you all know how to solve this. Hopefully. I hope. <laughs> so what you do is you add them together, and I get 3x equals 6. And so x is 2. And so now I take x is 2, and I go back here. And I see that 2 plus y equals 1. So that tells me that y is negative 1. Did I screw that up? No, that seems to work. <laughs> and so that's good. That's a good thing. Um, in terms of lines, we're saying we have the line x plus y equals 1. Um, and we have the line uh, y plus 5 equals 2x, I don't even know, doesn't matter. We have some line, do that, just line. 2x minus y equals 5, this is just sort of a sketch, it's already a wrong picture because y equals negative 1, there it is. 2x minus y equals 5, and we're finding this point, but you might ask yourself, what this has to do with this, right? I don't know if it's, if it's clear what this has to do with this. Or in particular, what does the equation 3x equals 6 have to do with this picture? So let's put that on hold for a minute. And then, similarly, 
if I have, if I go up a dimension, and I have, and since I had one worked out, it doesn't really matter, x plus y plus z is x plus y plus z is 2, 2x two minus 2y plus z is 1, x plus y minus z is minus 4. And again, my goal is to solve this system of equations. Is there anyone here who doesn't know how to do that? Is there anyone here who does know how to do that? Anyone here whose hand actually <laughs> doesn't go up? <laughs> so let me not do it. Everybody. Your hand doesn't go up. That's good job. Okay, so we use the same process. Right, the same, we use the same trick, we add together pairs of equations to make variables drop out. So let me just do it, I suppose. If I add, well actually, if I take this one minus this one, that would be very useful to me. So here's A, B, C. So if I take A minus C, this gives me 0, 0, 2z equals 6, so z is 3. So I found z very quickly. So z is 3. I could take some other pairing here, or I can just plug this back in and turn it into an equation in two variables. Right? So if z is 3, then I know that, for example, x plus y equals negative 1. <coughs> z is 3. This one tells me that 2x minus 2y equals 1 minus 3 equals negative 2. Did I screw up somewhere? And x plus y, this one is the same equation. Did I? Yeah, equals negative 1, so this one is of no use to me anymore. Is it, is it clear what I did here? Yeah. Okay. And then I just do the same thing I did over there. Here I can divide through and write this guy as x minus y equals negative 1. And then I can add them together and get 2x equals negative 2, so x equals negative 1. Did I make a mistake? No? And then, and then y must be 0. And so my, my, my solution is the point, well, there's my solution. Okay. And what I'm doing here, one way I can think about what I'm doing, try and relate this to what we've done before, is these are three planes. These are three planes. I don't know what they look like, but in general, if I take two planes, they cross in a line, and then I put some third plane in here, this will cross in some other line. My picture looks horrible. And this will cross in some line, that I can see. So here's, where's my third point? I've already lost it. And there's my best That looks terrible. But anyway, these three planes cross in a single point. And here's one plane, here's another plane, here's another plane. And this adding together of solutions is giving me some different plane that is related to the line where the two planes cross. So, now, probably when you thought about this kind of thing before, outside of this class, you didn't think of these as planes. These were just collections of piles of things that you're doing some algebraic stuff. But it's exactly the same as doing this geometric recombining the planes to find other planes and so on. If you think of these as planes rather than as lines, well, or in the case, not as lines, as equations, or in the case of lines, we think of these lines. So, so this line is something like, I don't know, x plus y equals, well, I don't know, it's a long slope. Something like that. These guys have different slopes, so they cross. 
But if I take x minus y equals 1 and x minus y equals negative 1, they're parallel. So there's no intersection. So here, I have no solution. And here I have one sol a unique solution. And then I have the other stupid case where I took, say, x minus y equals 1 and 2x minus 2y equals 2. These are parallel. These are the same line. And so here I have infinitely many solutions. So I have this situation where I have either a unique solution, no solution if the lines are parallel, or if the lines are the same, then anything on the line is a solution, so I get lots of solutions. I have the same situation here, except that I maybe have a couple of different kinds of infinitely many. Right? I could have... I could have here a situation where I have a unique solution if the planes are crossing in sort of general position. I could have no solution if the planes are all parallel. Well, I guess if two of the planes are parallel, it doesn't matter what the other one does to get no solution, so even if Right, it can't be on all three planes if two of them are parallel. Um, they don't. They don't have this. What? Don't they not have to be parallel for there to be no solution? I mean, you have like a triangle. Yeah, or I could have a triangle, right? I could have. I mean, they don't have to be parallel. The lines that the lines of intersections have to be parallel. Okay. So if I reduce, so that the two lines where they intersect don't meet. Then, but they could also be like, as he said, making, I can't draw it. That's a, no, that's a good triangle. Well, that's a good triangle, right? But they could, they could be, right, they could be, well, whatever. They could, they could meet. Yeah. It's a triangular prism. There's a triangular prism. Extend them to make plants. Yeah, and now it looks terrible. But anyway, we could do that. I could have a line of solutions where they all come together in some line. Again, it's really hard to draw this junk. So again, I could have infinitely many solutions where they all meet in one line. Uh, and so I have some more variations of when I get infinitely many solutions. They could all be the same plane, in which case I get a whole plane. But again, I have the situation where I have one, I have none, and I have infinitely many. And this is sort of a general property when you have systems of equations. You might have a unique solution, you might have no solution, or you might have lots of solutions. And so one of the sort of natural questions is to ask, when do I have one situation, when do I have another, without actually having to solve the equation, right? So here, uh, in, the, in, the, in the dimension two case, it's easy to see um, I don't need that. How about ax plus by equals c, uh, 1, 1, 1, a2x plus b2y equals c2. Here, if we look at the slopes, if the slopes are different, we have a, a unique solution. So if a1 over b1 is not a2 over b2, assuming there are better yet, a1, B2 is not A2, B1. The reason this is a better form is because maybe one of them is zero. If one of the B's is zero, we have a problem. So if this is a better condition, then that means uh, 
that for sure they cross because the slopes are different. So two lines of different slope have to cross in a way for them to get away from each other. So I'll have a unique solution. If these two numbers are equal, then either they were the same line or they were parallel lines, in which case, in both cases, I get either no solutions or infinitely many solutions. Right? But this is doesn't generalize so well. Yeah? Just out of curiosity, under what situations would you have more than one unique solution? Never. What does that mean, more than one unique solution? Unique means there's one. So, I mean, <laughs> right? So those are sort of contradictory. But in these cases, for, this, for these linear equations, which correspond to lines and planes and flat things in the sense of not bending rather than flat in the sense of planar, we always have one, none, or infinitely many. We can't get three. On the other hand, if we have something bent, there's a quadratic term there, or a cubic term, or something like that, or even an xy term, then we can get more. But because we're talking about flat things, two points determine a line. So they can, if they cross, then they cross. And they can't sort of cross and then come back and cross again, because they're flat. You can't do something like that. So I think this is really the question we're asking. When might I get two distinct, rather than unique, two distinct solutions that I can't sort of push one and get the other? And in this case, because these are linear equations, never. If I got one, I got one. Maybe I get a lot. But I either get one, zero, or lots and lots and lots. I eat. Yeah. Oh, how do you like distinguish between the different like, levels of magnitude of solutions? Like, if you say infinity squared, if it's not if they're all the same. We just say something like that. Well, yes, there is. There, there is a notion for that, and it's it's called the co-dimension. But uh, let's come back to that when we get some. So, 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 so let, me, let me say that a little. Let me go ahead and say that. Um, so imagine, I mean, here in, in lines, we only have a choice. There's no solutions. There's a point where there's a line's worth of solutions. But with planes, we have the so, right? So if I have two variables, I get none. Two equations. I get none, no solutions. I get a unique solution, or I get a line's worth. So you can call that infinitely many. If I have planes, well then again I have the case of none. I have the case of one. And now I have sort of two cases. I have a plane worth, and here I have a line worth. This is not a technical term. <laughs> right? So I, either my solution consists of a line of solutions, or maybe I have a whole plane full of solutions. That is, all three equations describe the same plane. In this case, if you think about three-dimensional space, as meaning I have three independent coordinates and a line meaning that I have one coordinate, then I have sort of one other, I have two directions I can move away from the line in that are independent. So my leftover is what's called co-dimension two. So it's just like the total of the space dimension. The total space minus how many dimensions of stuff I get. And this guy, if I have a plane worth, this is co-dimension one. Is that more useful than just saying a line is worth being Depends on who you're talking to. And whether, you know, if you're in seven dimensions, if you have seven equations and seven unknowns, it's a little easier to say, well, I have three dimensions of freedom, you know, then I have three and four. I have three that are in my solution set and four that aren't. 
So now I don't know what to say. I have a space worth. I have a four space worth. I mean, yeah. So the codimensional number uh, is directly um, affected by the dimensions you're operating within. Sure. Because a line in the plane leaves you only one dimension to play with, but a line in space leaves you two dimensions to play with. So the codimension is the stuff that's left over. The codimension plus the dimension is the ambient space. And, and this is actually a theorem in linear algebra about. <laughs> so don't tell us now. Well, I'm going to tell you. You've got to figure it out. It's about the dimension of the image and the dimension of the null space. The dimension of the image plus the dimension of the null space is the dimension of the space. Okay. That means nothing to you, so good. Um, okay. Now, where was I going with this? I don't know. Okay, so <laughs> we have we have uh, we have these equations now to solidify this process that we go through. Really, what we're doing is we are we combine the equate. So, so how about this? Um, if I have a system of linear equations. So that means I have some number of variables and some number of equations. So like in the case here, where I have two variables and two equations, I could have then then if I take so given this and if I take uh, so if I if I scale any of the equations uh, by multiplying by some non-zero number, the solutions don't change. In other words, if I have 3x plus 2y equals 5, that's a system of one equation and two unknowns, this has the same solutions, well, let's put another one there, x equals 1. This has the same solutions as 3x plus 2y equals 5 and 2x equals 2. Because I scaled this one by multiplying it by 2. If I multiply it by zero, then I sort of screwed stuff up. But I can always undo this by multiplying by the inverse of that as long as it wasn't zero. So that's one thing I can do. And then the other thing that I can do is that I can add together any, any has no e in it, any two equations. And replace one of those two by. In other words, if I want to solve three x plus two y, well, it's, that was a bad example. So if I want to solve x plus y plus z equals five, and x minus y plus z equals eight, I can add them together and get the new equation x. 2x plus 2z equals uh -oh, 13. And use that one as well. So this collection of three has the same solutions. So I can replace this one with that one. Now the reason that's true is because if the, if the, select, if the choice x, y, z, or however many variables I have, satisfies this one, and it also satisfies this one, then it will certainly satisfy their sum. Okay? So these together tend to be called elementary operations. So putting these two things together goes by the name elementary operations. 
And if I do, so theorem, which I proved by mouth rather than writing, but the theorem is sort of obvious. Applying elementary operations to a system of equations doesn't change the solution. So this is something, you know, you learned in, I don't know, when did you first do this? I don't know. In high school or junior high school, or maybe elementary school, but a while ago. You learned this, although you didn't say it this way. But if I just add together things, it doesn't change, and I just go through this process of trying to make variables go away until I figure out which ones are which, and then, then I have everything I need. Okay? Why does this matter? Well, so that, that tells us that doing this kind of process, like looking at A minus C, is, doesn't change anything. And, and I mean, the proof that that does is you just check that you always get the same solutions. But we can also sort of codify this process a little bit by, suppose I have Um, AX plus B, A1, X plus B1, Y plus C1, Z, I don't know, that's enough, equals K1, A2X plus B2, let me just do it with actual numbers, sorry, because I'm not proving anything. X plus Y plus Z equals 5, 2X plus 3Y plus 4z equals 9. I can rewrite this system. Uh, let's make it square. It doesn't need to be square. I can forget about the x, y's, and z's. And just think about this array. 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 1, 2 and play with this. Now somehow I'll have to use this 591. I want to sort of play with that as well. Now behind the scenes, I'm thinking of this as being the x's, the y's, and the z's. And I can really remember that I have x's and y's and z's by trying to somehow think of this object as a collection of vectors, 1, 1, 1. And then when I do something with x's, y's, and z's, I get 5. This statement, where I just peeled off the coefficients and wrote them in an array, and peeled off this and wrote it in a column, is really the same statement is saying the vector 1, 1, 1 dotted with x, y, z is 5. This dotted with that is this. And 2, 3, 4 dotted with x, y, z is 9. And 1, 1, 2 dotted with x, y, z is 1. These are exactly the same statement. But there's a funny kind of multiplication going on here. To combine the two. And it's goes by the name of matrix multiplication, which many of you have seen before. But we multiply a row times a column. And the reason we do that is to preserve this equation business. I'll come back to that in a bit. But now we can sort of, well, actually, let me, let me also, just for a minute, change this. Let me change this to, instead of this equation, this equation, 0, 0, 0. <laughs> 
that is I'm going to forget about the 5 and the 9 and the 1 for a minute. And I'm just going to think about this guy combined with that guy gives me all zeros. Now, if we do that, then we remove one of the possibilities from the solution. So I'm going to put this on hold for a minute. I'm going to think about planes and lines and hyperplanes and so on. Notice that if I have a system of equations and I'm thinking of them as either lines or as planes or higher dimensional planes or anything like that, if I have a system of equations, so equations in x, y, z, whatever, equals all zeros, this is called a homogeneous system. It doesn't mean that it's all mixed up like milk. It means that it's all zero on one side. But if you think about the situation, I have AX plus BY plus CZ plus DW equals zero, then always zero, zero, zero is a solution. In this case, again, this is linear equations. This means always the origin is a solution. We always have one solution, namely the origin. We rule out the case of the equations being inconsistent. We might have infinitely many solutions. We might have a plane of solutions or a line of solutions or whatever. But we rule out the no solution case because we just made it. We made them all pass through zero. Okay? And, and that seems like I've lost something, but I gained something. And what I've gained is I can just think about coefficients. In terms of lines, the question is, are they parallel? I mean, are they the same slope or are they different slopes? In higher dimensions, I have lots of slopes to compare, so I can't use this same slope, different slope stuff. Right? How many people already know this, what I'm talking about? Okay. I mean, so those of you that have linear algebra, then probably know this better. Um, but even if you haven't, maybe you did this in regular algebra. Um, I've lost track of where I am. Um, okay. So by passing to the homogeneous system, and then I'll come back to the inhomogeneous case soon. That means that like with that equation, I just have to look at 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 1, 2, and do stuff to it. And what I'm going to do is something that goes by the name Gaussian elimination. I'm just going to try and get rid of columns to get ones in the front. And what I like in the end to get to something so it looks like one, lots of zeros, there's only three, something like that. I'd like to be able to do stuff to it to get to this situation. Because this is telling me, if I do this, again, if I'm thinking in terms of x's and y's and z's, I'm saying x plus y plus z 2x plus 3y plus 4z equals something, equals something, blah, blah, blah. And when I transform it to this, I'm saying x equals something I know. That's what 1, 0, 0 equals whatever will mean. And this will tell me y equals something I know. So to solve the equation is to go through the process of transforming this leading matrix and keeping track of that 591 that goes with it, I'm going to put it here. And that will give us the solution. 
if I'm doing the homogeneous case, then I don't care, it's just zeros, they're always going to be zeros. If I can get to the identity, then there's a unique solution. And if I get to something less than the identity, then I have at least a line's worth, or maybe a plane's worth, or maybe a higher dimension's worth. I don't know if the point of this is lost on people. They're all looking at me very intently. I feel nervous. Um, okay. So that process here, let's just see if we can get from this guy to that guy. So, right, I just start with, I take this guy, and let's subtract twice this guy from this guy, and that'll give me I'll leave the 1, 1, 1 here. Now let's put the 5 here too, just for the hell of it. I'll put the 5 there, and I'm going to subtract twice this from that, so that will mean I get a 0, and uh, 1, and 2, and twice 5, subtract it from 9 is minus 1, and here, if I take twice this and subtract, if I take this and subtract it from that, I get immediately 0, 0, 1 equals negative 4. So that tells me right away Z is negative 4. So now I know what Z is. And then I can do the same game to try and get rid of these ones and this 2 by repeating this process. So I can take, well, I can kill off this entire column by using this 1 to get 1, 1, 0. I don't know what I'm going to get yet. I'm going to take this, this line and subtract it from that one. So this will be 9, because I take this minus that. And I'll take twice this and subtract it from that one. So that will tell me 0, 1, 0. Uh, twice this from that will be 7. And so now I'm done. Oh, I'm not quite done. So this has told me that z is negative 4, y is 7, and x plus y is 9. And now I, I know that y is 7, so if I subtract this from this, I'll, tell, I'll get that x is 2. y is 7, and z is negative 4. And that's probably the solution. <laughs> so, computers are a lot better at this than I am. But this process, which, I mean, has everybody done this before? Okay. So, this is called something like Gaussian elimination. What? It's the bane of your existence. It's the bane of your existence. Well, I don't like it much either. It's all right. Um, but, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so let's think about what I just did in terms of equations. It's good to say I'm confused because that makes me stop and try and explain. So we started with, this is just another way of writing, where did I start? This guy is just another way of writing x plus y plus z equals 5. That's this first row. This says 2x plus 3y plus 4z equals 9. And this one says x plus y plus 2z equals 1. Okay? But I just neglected to write the x, the y, and the z just because I felt like it. Ignore this. This is to confuse you. Now, what I did here, this first equation is 1, 1, 1 equals 5. There it is. And I want to make, I want to get rid of the x's. I could have chosen to get rid of the z's or whatever, but let's get rid of the x's first. So this, this line here, this is twice that. Now, I know it's okay to rewrite this as 2x plus 2y plus 2z equals 10, because it has exactly the same solutions as that. And I also know it's okay, in fact, let's make them all negative. It's okay to add two equations together 
and then replace one of them with the sum. So I added this to this that kills the x and leaves me an equation in y and z, which is what I did here. So this is the equation, no x's plus a y plus two z's equals minus one. And then I did the same game on this one, except I didn't need to multiply by two, I just subtracted one minus the other. And that one has the good fortune for me, since these are the same, that not only did I kill the x, but I killed the y at the same time. So I saved the step because that just fell away. And so now that already told me right here, c equals minus 4. Because I was lucky. If I hadn't been lucky, maybe I would have gotten 3 and a 5 here, and I would have had to do more work later. Okay, so now I look, so now I've reduced the problem. I'm happy with this one. And since I have a 1 here, I can use it to kill off the entries in the other guys because these are all zeros. That's the same as when over there I found out that z was 4, going back and substituting z equals 4 into this equation is just taking this one and using it to clear out this entire column. So here I use this one to clear out both of those with zeros by saying, well, since z is negative 4, then y plus 2z is negative 1 is the same as saying y is 7. Because z is negative 4. So you basically took 2 negative or 2 negative Yeah. Right, and so that, that told me a new equation with no z's. And that leaves me x plus y is 9. Which I think when I did it by hand over there, I got, I don't know where when I did it, but when I did it before, I had x plus y equals 9. So now I have the simpler thing, x plus y is 9 and y is 7. That would mean that x is 2. But again, I did it this way. If you program it's very easy to write a computer program to do this. Because you just take the first, take the top thing, take the first non-zero entries, use it to kill off all the things below it. Okay, now you got this and all zeros. Then move over, take this guy, who is the first non-zero entry in that, use it to kill everybody in his column. Okay, move over. Take the first non-zero guy, use it to kill everybody in his column, and you just keep annihilating the columns one by one by one until you either wind up with 11111 equals something, or if I had changed this a little bit, I might wind up with something like 100 equals 2, 010 equals 7, no other information. So if I've got a zero there, then that tells me I have a line of solutions because I've got a line of no information. Or if I've got a number here like a five, that would tell me there's no solution because it says zero equals five. Yeah? Is the correct way to think about this that you're solving a general case first on the, the left three columns and then you're applying it to a specific case on the right? Or I don't know what correct means. Well, that is a way to yeah. think of it. Okay. <laughs> another it way to think correct? of it. Another way to think of it is I'm changing coordinates until everything's easy for me. Okay. Which is kind of the way I. Well, I'll come back to that. Not today, probably. Right. Um, okay. But I again. So here, this this is a way to solve sets of equations and and to make the process extremely mechanical. It may be the bane of your existence or a puzzle. Well, it's only a puzzle if you don't like doing nasty arithmetic. Right? The puzzle is how to avoid multiplying by 47 twelfths and things like that. If, you don't, if you're a computer, multiplying by 2 and multiplying by 47 twelfths kind of the same. But if you're a person, you want to make sure that the arithmetic is, is nicer to do. And then it becomes a puzzle because you have to say, okay, if 
I can do this, then my numbers will stay whole numbers. But if I go that way, oh no, I get terrible denominators. So that's when it, and, you know, that's when it gets icky. Right. So that's when it gets icky. But the concept is easy. And, and I'm a pure mathematician, so concept is fine for me. Actual, you know, doing, I'll write a computer program to do it, thanks. Um, but this is exactly application of this. Just saying, do elementary operations, nothing changes, same solution. Okay. But we can also use this to sort of determine, even though I don't care what's over here, whether these, these equations are consistent or inconsistent. Right? If I have equations like x plus y equals 1, well, let's just make them be 0. So I'm going to do the homogeneous case. This is a very simple case. This does not have a unique solution. It's sort of obvious that it does not have a unique solution because this is 3 times that. This means that if I write this in the matrix form, I have 1, 1, 3, 3. I can put zeros over here if it makes you feel better. But I have that. This is a multiple of that. So if I do the game where I try and get rid of something, I can get rid of these threes quite easily. This becomes 1, 1, 0, 0. I have a row of zeros. I'm not going to be able to solve this. So I'm left with a whole line of solutions. The same thing will happen no matter how many variables I have if when I do this I eventually get a row of all zeros, something bad there. That tells me that I have, so I have, then I have infinitely many solutions. So in the 2 by 2 case, this is easy to see. It's a little less apparent. We have 12 equations and 12 unknowns, but it's doable. Right? We just start going. So if I have, you know, the system 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 2, 1, 2, 0. This guy, oh, I guess I need one more. One, two, three, four, five. Well, it's already bad. Um, <laughs> let's put some more in here. One, 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 zero, one, zero, one. Okay, fine. None of those are the same, right? Yeah. It's pretty easy to see since this plus, oops, this was supposed to be a one. Sorry. <laughs> This plus this is this. This is not going to have a unique solution. Right? This plus this equals this. So this will not have a unique solution because I can very easily get all zeros here. Which means that one of my variables is not going to be able to be found. You see that? Okay, I'm seeing a couple of blank spaces. Could you say that one more time? Sure. The second one is so a looking at this, first? looking at this matrix. Okay. Seeing that the third, the third row is the first row plus the second row. Oh, okay. If I add this to this, I get that, mm -hmm. which is how I made it up. Except I made a mistake and I wrote zero when I meant one. Then that tells me very quickly if this is the, the homogeneous case, that I have infinitely, I have, I don't have a unique solution. I don't have enough equations to expect a unique solution. Because this guy is really the same as those guys. The pair of these describes the same plane as this guy. So, and, and certainly, you can see that if I take, you know, two equations and three unknowns, so there's two equations and three unknowns, you can see, I won't expect to get a unique solution. 
At best, I can hope for a line. Because when I combine these, I can get rid of one variable, but I can't get rid of both. So I get a line of solutions. Yeah? So is the cotension of number that we were doing before just the number of rows and zeros that you get? Yeah. If you reduce the system, the co-dimension will be the number of zeros you get. Exactly. Yeah? You have a situation where I, like when, you, when you wrote it with the coefficients on one side and that line the yeah. solutions are on the right side. If you had a situation where the left side added up to another, like, like the first and second one that are there, if you had a situation where the left side added up but the right side did not, does that tell you that there are no solutions? That tells you it's inconsistent. There can't be two solutions because... So if I augmented this guy, I'm not thinking about the homogeneous case, this plus this is this, I have one, two, and eight. You know, there are no this solutions. has no solutions because when I add these together, I will get something that is a contradiction. This has to be a three to expect solutions. Right. But but in general, yeah. In general, we ran out of time. In general, um, we tend to work with the homogeneous situation, reduce it to the trivial case, and then go to the, the not inhomogeneous case. I didn't get nearly as far as I had hoped today, but that's because we got a little sidetracked with the earlier stuff, but I hope I clarified the earlier stuff for you. Um, so let's see, what should I call him now? Alphonse. So Alphonse will tell you something, or some other name. Uh, Armando. Armando will tell you about the same guy. In, in phrase 17. Oh, yeah. um, the recitation is to do the kind of stuff that I did at the beginning of the class that I don't have a lot of time to do. So you should definitely, before recitation, look at all of the homework problems that are due on Wednesday and use recitation to clarify anything about any questions you have about those. The homework that was assigned last week was to there is no two days homework. There's homework every week. And homework every week is due on Wednesday. 